everyone. My name is Nyla Shuja. Welcome to the debate. Now, viewers, we are going to be unraveling the most pressing issues that are impacting our lives and society. Now, today we will be tackling a challenge that is looming very largely over and that is air pollution and smog. That being uh, said, we will be witnessing, uh, rather we have been witnessing Lahore and other urban centers of Pakistan which have been enveloped in hazardous and toxic air quality. And the question basically arises, uh, should we be enforcing lockdowns to curb the smog or is there any other way forward? Now, uh, coming uh, to the fact that Lahore has recently ranked amongst the top cities with the worst air quality, you know, globally with an air quality index exceeding uh, various uh, 400 levels in certain areas. That being said, could the temporary lockdowns, as we saw uh, during COVID-19, offer immediate relief to the crisis? Or will there be a need for a more systematic or systemic uh, long-term approach? And we must be considering that the, the economic factors or the aspects and the social costs of the pro-lockdown stance and how do they really compare uh, to the potential health benefits. Now, understanding the whole situation, Punjab has been facing a severe health crisis which is caused by smog and the air pollution that is present and due to the hazardous smog with cities like Lahore and Multan that have reported the AQI levels which have exceeded in Multan specifically 2,000 in Lahore it has uh, surpassed 1,500 so Understanding this, we, we've uh, seen messages from Senior Minister Mariam Aurangzeb who's highlighted that the crisis is linked to climate change and unveiled a comprehensive 10-year smog mitigation plan. Now, furthermore, measures including electric buses, enhancing the forest cover, and enforcing emissions uh, control systems in the industries is also uh, being um, observed and taken a great look at. Furthermore, the government is also planning stricter regulations on the agricultural front and the urban development areas as well. Now the officials have hinted at a possible complete lockdown if the conditions persist with 50% of the public and private uh, organizations working from home arrangement that has been made in the vicinity. Now we're also going to be delving into the um, Beijing uh, model for the air pollution control and we're going to be trying to understand the lockdown regarding uh, this matter for positive steps or is it something that we should be double thinking. Now the root cause of smog as we know is air pollution viewers it's across the most densely populated areas and if there was less pollution we know that the impact would be less regarding the weather conditions now it is imperative to understand that the immediate impact of the AQI as we know the data from the COVID-19 pandemic the lockdowns globally including Pakistan have shown significant uh, short-term improvements in the air quality itself a lockdown could provide immediate relief uh, from the hazardous and the toxic air level qualities now but it could also have an implication on the economic fallout which means that Pakistan's um, various uh, uh, social and economic uh, dice, uh, areas of uh, people who are working in them, uh, they might be facing challenges earning from daily wages to commuting to office to making their livelihoods be sustainable. Now, we are going to be taking a look at that. And, and in our second segment, we're going to be taking a look at the, the, the very upsetting and the tragic martyrdom of Major Mohammed Hasib and Havaldar Noor Ahmed, um, who have passed away in the IED uh, last during the anti-terror operation in Harnai, Balochistan. It is a very upsetting situation and um, our sympathies and our support to the armed forces is, is steadfast and we support our armed forces immensely because this is a stark reminder, viewers, that the armed forces of Pakistan are working day and night to preserve the sovereignty and the sanctity that is Pakistan. And they're, they're putting their lives on the line and they they deserve a round of applause and they deserve our utmost respect. And we really need to understand the highlighting of you know, how the military is tackling this menace of terrorism that is persistent and how the army and the armed forces of Pakistan are standing steadfast. Now, moving on, we're gonna be coming back to our first segment, viewers. It is imperative that we welcome our wonderful guests, um, Imrana Tivada, who is joining us online, Eric uh, Shazer, who is an environmental environmentalist, and Ramaz Sandhu, 
uh, the assistant professor at Beacon House in Lahore. A huge welcome to you guys and a huge welcome to our senior analysts here present in the studio with us. Farah Patafi, welcome to you. And Raja Faisal, a welcome to you as well. Now, understanding, um, coming to you, um, Mr. Ramaz, uh, Beijing's air pollution control model, there's a focus on energy optimization and cleaner uh, fuels and emissions reductions that they focused on in 98 uh, to 2013 uh, and their intensive pollution control, the industrial restructuring that they uh, persisted uh, and they focused on regarding the cleaner energies in uh, 2013 to 2017 as well. So how is the government of Pakistan prepared to implement this Beijing style of policies and, and its strict regulatory framework and the subsidies for cleaner energy well thank you Naila, for having us um, firstly we need to understand that we have already been taxed for levies we know that it is essentially a tax that is going to be used for upgradation of our sort of fuel industry the question becomes why are we not really seeing any results in that pakistan which is importing fuels to a huge degree the quality of fuel that we have is still euro two so there we have the first step. So in the medium or short to medium term, rather, that is what we need to immensely focus on. Secondly, we need to move away from this attitude of actually lockdowns and bans. We need to understand that we learned a few lessons from COVID-19. And there are quite a lot of industries that can actually go online. So why are we taking steps that are rather late in this timeline? We have been seeing this results. This smog has been here for at least the past 15 to 20 days. But the actions that we are taking, they're slightly late. In the medium to long term, I think we have to focus on our industry. We have to focus on our transportation network. We have to think about marking a territory to our cities itself. We know that our Lahore is expanding. We know that another mega project like Ruda is going to happen in Lahore. We are moving towards a twin city concept. And we are already seeing the results of actually not making a mark outside or at least knowing where Lahore really ends. What happens to our local transportation system? What happens to the BRTs, the metros and everything else? We are going to be dependent on cars. 45 to 40% of the emissions that we record, they come from cars. And at least 20% comes from the agriculture burning. And is banning the solution? What are we going to do? Are we going to tell the farmers? When you travel on motorway, I frequent to Islamabad and I see that there are stables that are being burning by dozens. And can anything, can anyone do anything about it? That's the real question that we are looking at. I think the policies that we need to be looking into, they have to be long term, they have to be systemic and they have to be structural. Otherwise, we fall into the trap of actually making quick fixes and we will not be able to do anything about it other than just imposing lockdowns. In Karachi, for instance, every year we face rainfalls, we face flooding, we face uh, sort of uh, blackouts for days, but in the end we forget because the monsoon is over. Similarly, the smog has become another season in Pakistan. So in order to achieve sustainable long-term results, we have to look into our industrial policy, we have to look into our transportation policy, and we have to ensure that the sectors that have already learned how to actually move to an online mode of communication, they need to immediately move to that long-term online uh, sort of, at least for the smog season, at least for the smog season, we have to make sure that they move to that online medium of communication and we need to build our cities in a more sustainable manner where we ensure that buses, BRTs, MRTs, and uh, projects like Speedo, projects like Orange Line are encouraged and private car ownership is discouraged. It's not that people want intimacy, that's why they are owning cars. It's exactly because people have no other choice. A very interesting take. Eric, uh, do you seem to agree? Yes, absolutely. I agree with uh, what uh, he's spoken about lockdowns and sustainability being one of the vital aspects which we need to talk about. Uh, my own experience in Lahore while I was going to Kartarpur corridor uh, three years ago while it was uh, inaugurated by the former prime minister, I saw 
you know, stubble burning left, right, center, back, everywhere. And despite the Punjab government giving instructions to Brickkin's uh, owners not to enhance with crop burning, I, I saw it all happening. And even this year, Brickkin's owners, they decided to actually stop crop burning by the 15th of July. But I've read reports it's still happening, right? So I think it's a very big issue that we need to move to sustainable methods, such as the zigzag methods for crop burning as well. One other thing which I'm going to talk about is deforestation, which is taken very, very lightly in Pakistan. I think it is one of the national security issues right now in the country. We have forest cover of only 4.6%, while the UN suggests it sh we should have a forest cover of at least 10% of total land. And I mean, it's quite, you know, construction is good. Industrialization is good. As we see populations expanding, we see, country, we see cities which needs to be expanded and being top of their game. But at the same time, I'll give you an example of how while construction takes place in the UK, for instance, the local planning authorities, they only allow, they only permit construction if there is green space in the area. And if there has been any plans for expanding green spaces, if there are no green spaces in the area, for instance, in London, for instance, the local planning authority will not allow construction, right? And air pollution has been consistently linked with rapid industrialization and of course we have uh, environmental laws which needs to be updated as well one other thing which i want to talk about is we can't reverse the smog issue in the next few years it's a long-term project so what we can do right now is minimize the effects okay and the government needs to heavily subsidize in green energy and also focus on maybe short-term solutions such as living in a world of air purifiers right i mean air purifiers have worked out nicely however it's very expensive so tackling air pollution is an expensive cause right now okay i mean right now one piece of air purifier for instance costs around twenty-five thousand. what is the minimum wage in pakistan it's around thirty-seven thousand for each individual so i mean there is a lot of imbalance there's a lot of gap when it comes to tackling you know not just air pollution but climate change so i think like we need to make sure that we need to focus on vulnerable people getting affected most by air pollution because there is a lot of inequality and we should make sure there's a level playing field for people who are affected by air pollution Absolutely. Imran, I want to come to you. And uh, we know that various steps have been taken by the Punjab provincial government regarding the smog situation, and they've implemented the Green Master Plan uh, for Lahore to increase the forest cover, as uh, uh, Eric just mentioned, um, from 3% to 36%. So for the urban forest projects and mandatory water treatment plans for large houses under this discussion is being set. So what specific laws can Pakistan um, enact to hold the polluters accountable and make uh, this uh, Green Master Plan a success? Well, um, I think in order to um, hold the, um, in order to sort of uphold this ambition that we have of actually having a Green Master Plan, we first need to figure out what exactly are we going to do in order to host our population. That is the question at heart. I mean, if we are expanding a city, we are invariably taking in the agriculture right, Eric, land. Eric, I'm so sorry, but we're going to have to cut you off. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back, viewers. Now, as we were discussing uh, with our guests who've joined us online, Imrana, let's let's discuss the various steps that have been taken by the Punjab provincial government regarding the smog situation, the implementation of the Green Master Plan, and uh, specifically for Lahore to increase the forest cover from 3% to 36%. Uh, that being said, the urban forest projects and the mandatory water treatment plans uh, for the large houses are under discussion at the moment. So uh, that being said, what specific laws uh, can Pakistan enact to hold the polluters accountable and how effective <coughs> can we make this green master plan? Um, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, I will answer your question, but I'd like to start by saying that this is a gross national tragedy today that we're confronted with a, a national health emergency where people are living in toxic gas chambers. The AQI yesterday in Lahore, the average air quality index was 2,700. And at 300, if you have an AQI of 300, the WHO wants city evacuation. So can you imagine, we have a 22, 25, 2700, not only in Lahore, but also in Multan. I just like to very quickly say that the first Clean Air Commission was made 20 years ago. And we have been aware as professionals, as technicians, as scientists, that this was imminent. And I, I truly believe that this is criminal neglect for the people of Pakistan who today have to confront a situation where they cannot breathe. My point being that we have policies and recommendations for the last 20 years. We have the clean air policy. We have the, the uh, electric vehicle policy. We have the national oil refinery policy that made it mandatory for clean fuel to be used and converted from Euro 2 on to Euro 4, 5, 6, and 7. None of these have been implemented. Did we have to come to this point today where our children are on ventilators to realize that we need radical steps. We knew years ago that the life expectancy in Lahore has been reduced by seven to eight years. We also know that 80, 75 to 80 percent of all the emissions are vehicle driven. We also know and knew many years ago that we have lost 75 percent of our green cover due to deforestation and removal of, of ground cover. It's an, and the list goes on and on. But I would like today to turn to radical measures, which the Punjab government, I'm happy to see that they have done it a bit too late. The point being that the transition map for any company, any business, any conversion uh, is, is very, very important. Uh, it is, we have a city of 14 million people. I'm talking about Lahore. It's a mega city, one of the only cities out of, in the world. I think we have about 10 of them. One of the most important, I'll talk about three things, three uh, focal points. First, urbanization has to be limited and city boundaries have to be made so that we can then have integrated mobility planning. We can have integrated master green planning. We have none of it. We have no public transport. No one's following the e-vehicle policy. We don't even have footpaths for people in the hall. And of course, nobody can afford um, air purifiers. So where does the common man, Article 9 and 14 of the Constitution of Pakistan, demand that everyone has the right to life? What happened to our constitution? And what happened to the rights of all these people? What happened about non-compliance of the Oil Refineries Act when we can today convert it to Euro 4, 5, 6, and 7? And I can tell you that within months, we can reverse 50 to 60 percent of the pollution. What happened to the EV policy? Why are we not compliant? to the rule of law in the country. I think it's about time that we brought in, I, I hear today that the uh, Punjab government has talked about e-vehicles, very happy to hear it, but please, uh, uh, you know, for generations to come and from the people of Pakistan, we urge you to put this into effect, have compliance, have Euro 2 fuel banned completely and Euro 4, 5, 6 and 7 
have public transport buses that are run on electric uh, electric vehicles, electric bikes. It's been talked about. The construction industry, for example, for three months they have to, in Delhi, you're not allowed to bring in a diesel truck in for three months. You're not allowed construction for three months. You're not allowed any outdoor events or marriages for three months. And we knew all of this. So when we hear today, when we are in post-Holocaust and five-year-old children are sitting on ventilators, uh, did we have come to this point is my question. Having said that and having repeated the, the uh, you know, everything that we knew, we have a thousand policies here. I, I really urge the people of this country, the public sector, the private sector, the corporate sector, all of us, to come together and to make sure that there is compliance to what we are about to do to save lives on this planet with AI. Just my one last point, harnessing the power of AI. Today we can predict where we have open spaces in cities, particularly Lahore. In two months, we can reverse the 75% that we have lost right, uh, in 10 Imran years. Uh, Imran Sahib, I'm glad that you actually... Uh, uh, spoke out uh, about the uh, state of affairs in Punjab right now and then of course you also spoke about va various measures that can be taken. I was uh, looking at your suggestion regarding uh, you know construction industry. Uh, do we have any models how to actually restrain or tame this sector because it seems that it is unstoppable. It keeps on growing and there is deforestation also going on. And Imrana, you have uh, rightly pointed out that, of course, uh, uh, you know, EV, they need to be uh, heavily introduced in cities like Lahore. But, of course, that would take a hell lot of uh, money to, of, 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 of course, uh, introduce that and fix that. Uh, do we have that money? And if not, then can we seek uh, support from the developed world? Eventually, of course, the problems which are being faced by Pakistan, they are due to that developed world because their carbon emissions are far bigger than what Pakistan's are. This one is local. Absolutely. If I may just, I may just quickly respond to your, your queries here. Yes, 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 in a capital Y-E-S, we have the money. We have so much money, but it is not prioritized in its usage. If we can make Ruda, which is a, a city bigger than the footprint of Lahore, another 14 million people right within Lahore, we have the money to make Ruda, we have the money to make massive development projects that expand cities beyond proportion so that they become unmanageable and we don't have infrastructure. Can we stop and start balancing our resources and putting them, prioritizing them for people, not for machines and for roads and for plans that are completely unfeasible. To answer your the, the other query, uh, is there a development model for the construction industry? Well, there is a model. Uh, a lot of countries are following it. My, I will come back. We need to make the models. We've already made the models. Uh, we are ready to launch them. We're ready to, to assist the government. And like I said, we need to have the public-private sector. The model is there. The way the model works, the solution is this, that we make a transition map. And we tell people a few months, six months before, that you know you can have construction nine months of the year. But look, in three months, when our children are dying, we're not going to allow this, so please work, make your work plans accordingly. Marriages need to be banned for three months. People can have marriages from January to uh, October and then from February onwards. So when people know a year in advance about the way the things are going to roll out, the SOPs are made, the acts are put into place, the constitution is being followed, we're upholding the laws, our own laws. Everything will fall in place, but we do need to give a time to people to make transition plans. For example, today I've heard that the universities have been closed and put online. Students in hostels have told to, be, to go home. The buses are not going to operate. I think it's fantastic. The point being, can you take all these measures 
overnight and then expect that they're going to work, there is going to be chaos. So we need very quickly, it can be done very quickly to make a transition map, to put all this in order. We have the expertise, the professionals, the capacity. It's just a matter of sitting down and saying, look, Pakistan has to get back on track. We, we went to COP and we put in the loss and damages because we produce less than 1% of the emissions and are out of the seven most, most affected countries in the world. We're the ones who launched that we should have loss and damages from the rest of the world. And yes, we must. But it's about time that Pakistan pulled its socks up and started looking at the well-being of its people as a priority. We're all in favor of development, and inshallah we will develop, but not at the cost of lives, at the cost of people not being able to breathe, drinking toxic water, uh, carcinogenic vegetables. I mean, which country can prosper? So we need to get all our priorities in order, and inshallah I'm very, very hopeful. When I said it's a holocaust, yes, it's given us a, a huge shock, and I hope that we can now get back on track. And I'm very hopeful that we can reverse this. We can reverse it in less than six months. And inshallah, we will do it. We have to reduce a vehicular, you know, sort of, um, uh, uh, we, I don't know, maybe we need to have heavy taxation on buying vehicles. Um, I mean, there are so many measures that, that have to happen which are radical. And then they can scale out. In very, years. very interesting points you've raised, and they seem to be agreed upon. Majority of them. Now, that being said, uh, coming uh, to you, uh, Ramaz, uh, um, understanding that we are aware of artificial rain that has um, been uh, done in rural areas of Punjab. How has that impact been, and what can we expect further? And Mr. Sandhu, obviously. Uh, you know that there was uh, namaz e istisqa which was uh, offered today and after that in islamabad and rawalpindi we have the showers finally uh, can we say that uh, the uh, rains in lahore they are required as well and if they are required what could be the magnitude of the rain which is required to clear everything from there well, uh, the question that you have really posed me is that the surgeon has arrived, should I fall from the stairs again? So we need to really understand that the problem that we have is systemic. It's going to come again. Last year in the area of Shadra, with the help of UAE government, we had the showers, we had the artificial rain. But we know that the intensity of it was remotely not as much that was required to really curb the effects of smog. This year, if we have, I mean, that's fantastic to hear that in Islamabad we have had some showers, but what after that? What, what's gonna happen when we have, we have to understand that these are two parallel issues that are running. One is climate change. The other issue is going to be the effect of waste management. Climate change is a waste management problem. It's not solid waste. We can't see it. It's in the air. Uh -huh. Similarly, with smog, it is a symptom of the larger issue that we have in terms of our development, in terms of our usage of fossil fuel, fossil soil, fossil fuels, and in the end, we have to change our outlook towards how we look at land and our relationship with the land. Uh -huh. Rain patterns are going to change. Climate change is here, it's here to stay, and we have to adapt with the climate change. So next year, if we do not have the rains, or how efficient are we going to get in terms of actually dropping that artificial rain? I think that those are some of the questions that might temporarily relieve us from the real issue. But the real issue is not going anywhere. We're, continue, we're going to continue with emissions, and we do not just uh, to be on the record, I think I should mention that we do not have efficient monitors to really understand how much of carbon monoxide is in the air. Right now, what we understand is perhaps a little more than the tip of the iceberg. We do not know what the composition of our air is at the moment. We know that it's okay. We really understand particulate uh, matter 2.5. 
and we know that it is, you know, um, in a million, it's like 2,400 or whatever the AQI says. But what's going to really happen when we try to understand the whole profile of our air that we breathe? I think yeah. for that, we need to be really surgical in terms of understanding and then in terms of responding and then trying to look at who are the contributors. And the capital is never really going to flow just out of altruistic reasons, just because they care about our children or they care about our own health. There, it, it, the capital is not going to flow there, even if it's with EV policy, even if it's with stable burning or whatever. I think we need to understand that we have to hold hands of all of these stakeholders and we need to make a cohesive and a comprehensive plan for the next 10 years where we are going to systematically change all of that. We are going to avoid the activities that really contribute to it. And we are going to provide incentive to those in industries to transition into greener and cleaner energy production. Yeah, and I think at the end of the day to... Yeah, very, very Please. nicely put, uh, Gamas. Uh, just wanted to go towards, quickly go towards uh, Eric. Eric, you actually are living in one of the, obviously, the biggest metropole of Pakistan. And uh, right now, of course, Karachi is not facing any troubles like this. Has it got anything to do with the sea and the water resource, obviously, next to Karachi itself? And can we say that Lahore is facing these problems because Ravi is as dry as anyone could be? And by the way, Eric, uh, there seems to be a ritualistic, mm. a seasonal approach to climate change or fighting climate change, right? Uh, every year, whenever there's smog, we all of a sudden are concerned. We keep on talking about it. But then uh, the year passes and most of the months, we are not even paying any attention. Similarly, floods come once in a while and because of that, everybody is obsessing, mm. but then it goes away. Why do you think we lack institutional focus and persistence? Good question. That's a very good uh, question right there. First, I'll answer Raja Saab. So I think Karachi has been very lucky with the sea breeze. However, what's different from, from Karachi to Lahore is that in Punjab side, we've had unprecedented rice production. With rice production, we have crop residue. And with, as Gamaz also mentioned about stable burning as well, and that's been unparalleled, that's been unmatched in Punjab side. So I think that is one of the biggest factors when it comes to air pollution and smog in that part of Pakistan. While on the other hand, I believe that construction in Lahore has been massive and we have not had environmental policies which make sure that construction should be in line with green spaces, as I also mentioned earlier. Uh, I am originally from Karachi, but I'm in London right now. And as I mentioned, no construction, no matter how big of a company it is, it will not take place if it does not comply with environmental regulations, be it wherever you are in the United Kingdom. And I think that's a policy which we should focus on a lot. And I think that brings the point of climate accountability. And I've been in touch with a few of the senators uh, in Pakistan. I've talked about introducing green fines, make it a crime if big industries corporations are not in line with environmental uh, regulations as well. And by making it a crime, it will deter big corporation and industries for you know for you know contributing to air pollution and uh, enhancing climate change it will not only deter but if you go for you know go for green fines you can also generate revenue and invest back in climate mitigation and adaption strategies as well one thing i think you know which is essential for lahore is congestion charges Many countries are introducing congestion charges in heavily densely populated areas as well. It's, it can't, I mean, you can't have a figure in lakhs with you charge. Even a small amount will deter people to use electric, you know, to deter petrol vehicles or diesel vehicles in busy areas. They might walk, right? I mean, we need to make more, you know, green spaces 
not only when it comes to construction, but make cycling, you know, a habit in Lahore and Pakistan in general, make walking an exercise, which uh, I think it's not that mainstream as well. I mean, people are performing indoor cardio activities as well. So I think small changes will make a big difference out there. I My last it's point. A, it's the perfect example. Perfect example is of London. Obviously, 20 years ago, they started the congestion charges. And at the same time, they introduced the electric uh, vehicles or electric uh, bicycles there as well which are obviously you know maneuvering around within the city and that has actually brought an excellent effect on it of course of course so there is no one solution to the crisis there is a combination of policies and initiatives which we should take and once we go on with the policies and the project we'll see progress and I think it's very important to move towards nature-based solutions as well so as as Civilians, as individuals, we all have responsibility, but the government should also focus on nature-based solutions. Short-term you know, lockdowns will work. Absolutely. Very interesting recommendations, Eric. Uh, now, um, <coughs> thank you to our guests who have joined us online, Ramaz and Eric, who have joined us virtually for this debate. And now moving towards our second segment, we are discussing the upsetting and tragic uh, martyrdom of Major Muhammad Haseeb and Havaldar Noor Ahmed in the IED blast in Hanai, Balochistan. And Balochistan once again underscores Pakistan's ongoing struggle against the menace of terrorism. And it is extremely important to discuss this matter that the sacrifice is a stark reminder of the grave and um, virtuous sacrifices of our armed forces who are on the borders and fighting against terrorism and against this menace of terrorism that is plaguing the, the nation. And it is because of them that three terrorists were neutralized and they're, they're planning attacks on the civilians and they were neutralized. And this highlights the military's unwavering commitment to peace and stability in the region. Now with that, Balochistan and Khyber Bukhtunkhwa are facing a resurgence in the terrorist activities and the stakes have never been higher, viewers. Uh, the recent CRSS report reveals that a troubling 90% increase in uh, the violence over the past quarter um, with these two provinces bearing the brunt, which is 97% viewers of fatalities that have occurred. Um, amidst the escalating threat, the Pakistan army has remained resolute and steadfast, and it's continuing the operations with the full backing of the entire nation. Now, that being said, um, the chief of army staff, General Asim Munir, during the major Hasib's funeral, he was uh, present, and along with the chief of army staff, the planning minister, Asim Iqbal, and other senior officials were also attending the funeral. And the chief of army staff emphasized that the nation's solidarity with the armed forces is strong against terrorism. So, Farooq, understanding this situation, this very upsetting situation that has occurred, what can we take away from the chief of army staff's statement? Uh, right. Uh, thank you very much uh, again. Uh, regarding army chief, uh, you're uh, perhaps referring to a statement that was delivered at Magda Dialogues, right? Mm. Uh, there he actually covered a lot of bases. He actually to talked about war and terror, particularly TTP uh, being uh, now home to the world's uh, terrorist organizations. It seems to be an organization that seems to be churning more uh, terrorist organizations. And Afghan um, uh, soil is being used against Pakistan. Uh, then, of course, is the matter of how the country actually fights uh, use and abuse of technology. So he spoke there uh, very clearly about that as well. Uh, and all this talk about free speech, how uh, misinformation and disinformation can be weaponized uh, to harm the body politic of the country. So I think that uh, he emphasized many important things. And then, of course, the, uh, the armed forces and their, uh, their resolve uh, to fight terrorism um, that was also underscored. So I think that uh, the message was loud and clear. All these elements that are actually killing or hurting Pakistanis, they have to go. They ha this uh, swamp has to be drained. And uh, for that army is singularly qualified to fight them. Uh, the only thing is that in this country, because of the nature of our politics, people, I, I don't know whether politicians have a death wish or something, but they keep on critiquing uh, the only force that is standing between them and all these assailants 
So I think that uh, right now we have to stand with the armed forces. We have to ensure that external and internal elements are neutralized and this country can progress. So Army Chief uh, very clearly indicated what can be done, what should be done, and naturally then you heard my, my own comment as well. Mm. Absolutely. Faisal, would you care to add something to this? Yeah, uh, obviously, Naila, when we talk about uh, this uh, very sacrifice uh, which we uh, saw of uh, the officer, Major Haseeb, uh, and yesterday he was uh, laid into uh, his uh, grave after the martyrdom. He uh, actually sacrificed his life for the nation, and we know that the activities, uh, IBOs, they are ongoing in uh, Balochistan and the uh, northern part of, uh, of Pakistan as well. Because Farooq has rightly pointed out that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the war is still on and uh, everyone amongst us, we of course need to be part of it. And when it comes to uh, statements uh, from Chief of the Army Staff, Chief of the Army Staff, the uh, the key points which uh, we have all we have always been highlighting this and this coming out from chief of the army staff it is uh, 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 very to the point and that was related to of course isis khorasan and ttp both of them they are of course in uh, spread in three of the provinces of uh, afghanistan bordering with uh, pakistan and from where they are, of course, facilitating other band outfits as well, other terrorist organizations as well, be they ETIM, be they IMU, or be they BLA, BLF, all of them, they are being catered from there. And uh, that needs to be, of course, looked into. When we talk about TTP, when we talk about uh, uh, ISIS Khorasan, these are the menace that are not only affecting Pakistan, but of course, they can be a huge menace for the whole world once more. We shouldn't be forgetting that Al-Qaeda was there once, and they, were, they became a havoc for the world. And now ISIS Khorasan and TTP, they have the same disease that can be a havoc for the whole world once more. So Pakistan is at the front line fighting against the terrorism and here is the world that must be contributing uh, their uh, part as well. It shouldn't only be Pakistan and when it comes to you know, uh, people at large, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, cyber warfare which was being applied on Pakistan, that is, uh, uh, that needs to be, of course, taken care of. When it comes to Pakistan's forces, Pakistan's intelligence agencies, Pakistan's uh, uh, security forces, all of them, they have been playing their role. And uh, the kind of uh, efforts they have been doing, they can be uh, uh, doubled uh, in terms of po very positively with the further uh, countering the menace which is uh, on the social media that can be countered and it must be uh, countered by all of the political parties of Pakistan and with the people at large. So this uh, uh, needs to be done and I think uh, uh, the sacrifices of our security forces, they are uh, uh, you know, always hailed and that's how it should be and uh, we should never be forgetting that the kind of uh, peace we see around us that is just because of the sacrifices made by our security forces and intelligence services. And by the way, I just wanted to comment about the, the this sacrifice once again. If you have seen the picture, Naira, mm -hmm. of uh, the martyred, uh, uh, you know, Major, uh, he is a very young man, right? Yeah. Um, uh, a, a face full of innocence. So one, one thing that one keeps on thinking is how much more uh, you know sacrifices this country will be asked to give mm -hmm. and these are people i mean hats off to their parents uh, their mothers especially who ha who actually send such uh, uh, raise such lions and then send send them to, to sacrifice their lives but then we have to wake up these are our kids we cannot allow them to be killed in this way repeatedly constantly never endingly so we have to come together as a nation and put an end to the menace of terrorism. True. Absolutely. Very, very well said, Farooq. Now, viewers, uh, that's all the show that we have for you today. Uh, we spoke on Pakistan, how it's facing, at, it's at a crossroads regarding the battle against smog and whether it's, it's choosing the immediate relief through the lockdowns or through per the persuasions of long-term strategies inspired by the global leading uh, countries who have various models regarding smog and climate, um, air pollution implications. And it is, uh, it is the path forward that we need to 
focus on. Now, furthermore, we also discuss the martyrdom of Major Hasib and Havadar Noor Ahmed. And it's, it's a firm <coughs> reminder, viewers, that these sacrifices that are made for Pakistan in Pakistan will not go in vain as we are fighting against the menace of terrorism. Viewers, that's all the show we have for you. A huge thank you to our senior analysts who joined us in the studio, Farah Qutafi and Raja Faisal. And thank you so much for watching. This is Naila Shaja. You are watching the debate here on PTV World. Take care.